May 30th, 1937. Warm weather, clear skies. The perfect Sunday for a picnic to celebrate Memorial Day. Families gather to enjoy the holiday, but in the south side of Chicago, workers of Republic Steel were gathering for a very different reason. Little did they know that the peaceful picket they had planned would soon turn into one of the bloodiest labor battles in U.S. history. In the early 1900s, the United States steel industry was booming. Large corporations dominated the industry, making enormous profits. However, workers had low pay, long hours, and harsh working conditions with little say in their workplace. In order to further reforms, unions participated in protests and strikes. In 1919, steel workers held a strike against the U.S. Steel Corporation for a union contract. Despite mistreatment from police, newspapers blamed workers for the conflict. As a result, the public viewed the workers as radicals and the strike brought forth no reform. Situations improved on July 5, 1935. The Wagner Act was passed, laying a foundation for union rights. Steel workers hoped for change, but corporations were intractable. In 1936, many steel workers joined the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, or SWOC. The increased pressure on companies caused U.S. Steel to accede. In 1937, the company agreed to give workers better conditions and a union contract. Shortly after, Little Steel gave workers the same benefits but remained anti-union. Republic Steel Chairman Tom Girdler believed a surrender to the CIO was a bad thing for our companies, employees, for the United States of America. We were determined to fight. Thus began the Little Steel Strike of 1937. On May 26, strikes, organized by the SWOC, spread across the country, notably in Ohio, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. Unlike other plants, the Republic Steel plant in Chicago remained open during the strike. On May 30th, 1937, workers of Republic Steel gathered for a civilized demonstration that quickly turned into a violent encounter between the protesters and Chicago policemen. Later known as the Memorial Day Massacre, the strike attracted widespread controversy due to the unprecedented attention it was given by the media, along with the photographic documentation of the event. The newsreel and images of the event brought forth an exchange of public views from workers instigating the strike to being vulnerable victims of police brutality. This reduced violence in labor struggles and sparked an exploration into using the power of media and photographic documentation to spread the truth. On Sunday morning, after a mass gathering at Sam's Place, the union headquarters, workers headed to the Republic Steel plant for a peaceful picket hoping to finally persuade corporations for a union contract. As the workers moved to surround the building, they encountered the Chicago police force, who had been waiting for their arrival. When protesters refused to disband, cops began arresting them. Confusion followed as strikers encountered extreme violence. Police, armed with revolvers and clubs, threw tear gas bombs into the crowd. 15 seconds, more than 200 shots, fired blindly at strikers. As civilians attempted to run away from the violence, police beat many innocents with no regard for human life. Molly West, a young girl, recalled a policeman yelling, Get off the field or I'll put a bullet in your back. Police ruthlessly shot Nicholas, an 11-year-old boy, in the foot and an infant in the arm. Shortly after, the dead and injured were tossed into wagons. These strikers required immediate medical attention, which they did not receive. When the confusion was over, 10 people, only two of them workers, were left dead, one of them being a 17-year-old boy. Dozens more were severely maimed. Although the workers had encountered violence, bloodshed, and mistreatment, changes were yet to come. In the days that followed, the press wrote an overwhelming number of articles about the encounter, as workers were crudely portrayed as a mob. This negative image spread rapidly, and the Memorial Day Massacre was dubbed a Republic Steel Riot. Paramount cameraman Orlando Lippert had filmed the massacre, but the newsreel was immediately suppressed for fear of arising riots. Controversy soon arose over who had started the violence, and Republic Steel, which had the media and authorities on their side, 
used newspapers to target workers as the instigators of the strike. Shortly after the event, the newsreel was released. The truth was out, or so the workers thought. Instead of exposing the misconduct of the police, the released film portrayed an edited encounter, one that favored the police. The La Follette Committee, a committee of the U.S. Senate that looked into violations of free speech and labor, helped unveil the truth by investigating the event. After analyzing the raw newsreel and hearing multiple testimonies, the committee concluded that the encounter should have been handled with less force. The uncut newsreel, released in late June after the investigation, precipitated an exchange in the public's views of the workers. This newsreel proved the workers' innocence and showed that the police were at fault. People were appalled at the violence, and their initial disdain for the workers was exchanged for sympathy. Although the corporations did not immediately partake in this exchange, in 1941, Little Steel caved. Companies finally gave workers the union contract they had pursued. Although the events of the massacre had not immediately caused reforms, it set many precedents for visual evidence. The strike was one of the first times such a brutal encounter had been so thoroughly portrayed by the media, displaying the impact that media can have on public perception of events. The newsreel and images of the massacre were accompanied by captions with bias towards corporations, despite clearly showing mistreatment to workers, exploring the effect that media can have on the public. Because the public firmly believed what was written, they sided with the corporations. Since this was one of the first times an issue had been publicized in such mass proportions, the public's perspective was easily swayed, showing how the media could have an enormous impact on public views. The newsreel of the encounter that was shown to the La Follette Committee was one of the first times in congressional history that a film had been used as evidence, exploring the use of photographic documentation in the courtroom. It brought the, the, the media um, into uh, discussions of, of these kinds of events, so uh, it sort of modernized Congress immediately. Suddenly you have evidence and you, you can see things. This method preceded the common use of videos and photos as evidence in court today, setting up the notion that seeing is believing. The newsreel of the event also displayed the importance of concrete evidence of an event. In 2015, the Laquan McDonald shooting sparked intense controversy as a police car camera recorded a teenage boy being shot 16 times by a policeman. The video was then used as evidence in court to press charges against the police officer and get justice for Laquan. The example set by the photographic evidence used in the Memorial Day Massacre showed the importance of having impartial evidence as well as the benefits of documenting events on film. Events such as the McDonald shooting and the strike also proved the importance of police body and car cameras to document potentially threatening situations. In 2015, almost all the states in the U.S. considered using police cameras and five enacted legislation regarding them. The Memorial Day Massacre also stemmed the flow of police brutality and labor for the next few generations. The newsreel that was released across the country, aside from Chicago, where it was censored, cautioned the public and law enforcement, helping control the amount of force used in confrontations with civilians. In a sort of larger way, that kind of violence where the police would actually shoot workers in the back, that kind of violence stopped for quite some time. So it, it stopped it for like the next generation or so. In New York, the newsreel was used to train policemen of how not to act in volatile situations. The Memorial Day Massacre soon served as a warning, preventing extreme police brutality and labor in the coming generations. Through photographic documentation of the violent encounter, what started out as a story as savage as any turned into a powerful representation of the struggles and injustices workers faced in the 1930s. The Memorial Day Massacre of 1937 exchanged public views, swaying opinions for and against workers. The newsreel and images of the event significantly reduced police brutality and labor and explored how photographic proof can be used to obtain justice and expose the truth.